Hi, this is Sable Schultz, she, her pronouns, Director of Transgender Services at the Center on Colfax, and I am here today again with David Duffield, historian at the Center on Colfax, to give us our next installment of Queer Stories from the African Diaspora. Uh, David, how are you today, and what are we talking about today? Wonderful, Sable. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm doing well. Good, glad to hear it. So today we're only going to be looking at um, queer stories from the African, uh, middle, or from the Middle Passage. Um, we're specifically going to be looking at uh, stories from a book called Recreating Africa, Culture, Kinship, and Religion in the African Portuguese World by historian Jonathan Sweet from 1441 to 1770. And specifically four cases of uh, gender nonconforming men who presented as women for sex work, or uh, men-loving men in the Portuguese uh, African Middle Passage. So when we're thinking about this period of time, we have to imagine Africa just after the collapse of major dynasties in the Western part of the country and the rise of new dynasties in the post-Islamic world. This is exemplified by um, kingdoms such as Benin and Dahomey on the coast, which eventually became so extensively involved in the slave trades that anywhere from one third to over half of their populations were people who were traded as slaves. However, as historian Jonathan Sweets notes, um, these kingdoms, which are today and present day uh, Guyana, uh, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, were um, first quote unquote colonized by the Portuguese around the beginning to middle of the 15th century. So around 1410 to around 1470. In the middle of this period of time, large numbers of Portuguese sailors were trading with these African kingdoms. And African slavery had been going on as it had all over the world for thousands of years. But the particular thing about this form of slavery was that like later empires, the Dutch, the French, and the British, who eventually took over these same routes of trade, humans were the commodity. And with the discovery of the New World in 1492, so to speak, and the conquest by the Spanish, the Portuguese and the Spanish also started to conquer lands, particularly along the islands in the Atlantic and eventually Brazil for the Portuguese. Large numbers of, of people were traded as slaves from these large slave trading kingdoms along the western coast. Sweet notes, however, that not only were large numbers of these people single men, but they were also a large number of people who performed sex work. Sweet suggests that these large scale kingdoms had large number, uh, excuse me, they had large numbers of uh, gay men living in them. Essentially what happens is, is that these people leave their homes, they're in search for work or a better life. Some of them fall on hard times and some of them end up doing work. And then eventually some of them end up getting uh, traded into slavery. Many of the folks who ended up being traded into slavery were descendants of people who were conquered in the various wars of Western Africa. But these large scale single male population centers uh, of which uh, Sweet calls them quilombos were central to the, the number of slaves that exited out of Africa between 1410 and about 1710. Anywhere on those 300, uh, over the course of those 300 years, uh, according to Sweet, somewhere between three quarters and nine out of 10 people traded in the slave trade were men, which created a large homosocial culture for wherever they landed. We'll get a little bit more into the dehumanizing and, and um, extraordinarily terrible conditions of the Middle Passage uh, a little bit later. But for this time, we're gonna focus on the lives of several men. Sweet notes that the large homosocial world of the Atlantic slave trade um, out of this, out of this uh, empire of the West created large, what other historians have called sporting male cultures, or that is communities aligned along sex trade and entertainment. Sweet traces similar communities uh, throughout Western Africa. He calls them a merit-based male warrior society that erased natal lineages. In other words, these were communities of men who were not related by blood, but were a, incorporating large numbers of single men for um, uh, who, who played as like mercenary armies in West Africa. And from these populations, many of them took lovers. 
in the Portuguese Inquisition records, sweet notes between uh, 17, I'm sorry, between 1441 and 1770, um, there were only around 100 cases of men, of slaves being, um, being uh, accused and tried for sodomy. And of these, 23 of them were for, uh, were for men who were also cross-dressing. Father uh, Cristóbal Guayeva noted that many of the slaves were brought from a, quote, evil state, meaning they were sodomites. Um, he references the poor and working class men of the slaving kingdoms like Dahomey and Benin, connecting them with uh, sex economy, as well as uh, living in these Columbus of, well, of Western Africa. In 1556, um, sweet notes, Antonio, uh, a slave of uh, Paulo uh, Manriquez, arrived in the Azores in Benin. Um, he noted that Antonio, uh, in the Inquisition records, refused to wear the clothes given to him, instead dressing with a white waist jacket, vest, tightly wrapped white linen around his head, and with a hat, and uh, was commonly mistaken for a woman. Antonio worked as a professional prostitute, going by the name Vittoria. Antonio was well known and had a, quote, thriving business, uh, in which he had multiple um, clients throughout the island. He became so well known that he was embellished or excuse me, embroiled in scandals on the island and eventually brought before the Inquisition uh, who believed that he was a biological woman. Antonio swore that he was a biological woman and that there were many people from, um, the, from the place that he came in the Angolan coast who were known as Buraco or people who had the quote organs of a woman. He stated that there were many women who had similar conditions also in the colonies of Benin and that ultimately uh, he thought that he was a woman. According to the Inquisition records, Antonio was brought before a medical doctor, given a, a, biolog or a medical exam, uh, at which point the, the doctor determined Antonio to, quote, be a man or a woman, but not a hermaphrodite, saying that he had the organs of a man, even though he thought he had the organs of a woman. Uh, Sweet notes that he might have been referring to the receptive uh, act in sodomy, uh, as a metaphor for his being a woman, and something gets lost in the translation. But what we do know from the Inquisition records is that Antonio was sentenced to the king's galley. He was sentenced to a lifetime of service at sea. Around 50 years later, Juan de Gu uh, Gu uh, Guiné of Brazil was brought before the Inquisition, was accused of conducting a nefarious sin, committing sodomy basically with another man who was enslaved to a different person. Um, his accuser brought him before the Holy Inquisition, and at which point he refused to acknowledge the fact that he was a passive partner in the relationship. Um, the accusation carried with it the penalty of death. What Sweet notes about this case is that it exemplifies the kind of risk that people faced if they were brought before the courts, uh, especially being people who were technically the property of others. The lives of these men is not necessarily well documented by the court records, but what is known is that this partner was uh, sentenced again to the king's galley, the same as Antonio of Benin. Um, Antonio of Benin, by the way, eventually what made it back to Angola, um, according to the Inquisition records. But for, um, for Joan, we don't really know what ends up happening to him, except that he's sentenced to serve the rest of his life on king's ships, likely as a hand or as a slave. A generation later in Lisbon in 1647, a doctor by the name of Francisco Vaz de Gouveia heard of two slaves, Antonio and Francisco, talking about their relationship. He decided to bring them before the court of inquisition because one of them was his property. Francisco propositioned Antonio, who spent the night with him, and these were two men who were enslaved in wealthy households. And so it gives light to the fact that within the households, these men were able to court each other, they were able to go through a process, and they were also able to um, live together for several months without people finding them out. Antonio uh, noted that he loved Francisco and that he refused to acknowledge their relationship before the Holy Inquisition. Um, again, they refused to talk about the act of sodomy, which could have garnered the, de the death uh, penalty for both of them by being burned or garroted, which meant choked to death or uh, burned alive at the stake. Um, Antonio, his boyfriend, was sentenced to the king's galley for several years, and we don't really know what ends up happening to him. However, according to Sweet, Dr. Francisco Vaz de Gavoya, um, 
later manumitted his slave and the slave went on to live in um, the colonies. Around 40 years before this, there was another slave named um, Francisco uh, Manacongo, who was brought before the Holy Inquisition by a man named uh, Matias Moreira. Moreira thought that uh, Manacongo was uh, a woman because Manacongo uh, presented as female for sex work. Um, they lived in the colony of Bahia, which is in south cent southeast central Brazil in what is today the state of Bahia. Um, Moreno noted that uh, he had traveled the coasts of Angola and Congo as a businessman, and see he had, he had seen, quote, many pagan, pagan Negroes who did the same thing as what he saw uh, Manacongo doing, which is that they were performing sex acts as well as dressing as women. But he noted that in contrast with his own society, the, the, he meant the Christian, Catholic, uh, Portuguese empire, um, that these folks were elevated in society, and they were healers, and they were celebrated as a caste of uh, almost noble people. He called them Jim Banda, thinking that it meant some sort of curse or some sort of reference to sodomite. In other words, thinking that it meant a bad word. But in fact, according to a uh, linguist quoted by uh, historian Jonathan Sweet, the word origin is actually related to uh, Mbanda or a medicine man in the languages of Western and Southwest Africa. Sweet suggests that these uh, Kimbanda were a powerful caste in uh, indigenous Angolan societies. They had political power, they had different kinds of uh, economic and ritualistic power. And like most African societies along the West and Southwestern coast, in fact, over the whole of Africa, they represented a caste of either queer presenting people or people who were imbued with special powers because they could navigate both the masculine and the feminine. And this is true of most non-industrialized cultures that they uh, recognized that queer people were special because they could find the balance in the world. Um, that is not, however, true of European cultures. In short, Every culture on earth recognizes queer people as special for spiritualist reasons because they represent balance between masculine and feminine. In a contemporary time in the New World, uh, Aztec and Mayan queer people were also being subjected to the Inquisition and were being burned alive and killed at the stake uh, in multiple documented cases throughout Mexico and Central and South America. What's interesting about this case, though, is that the Angolan society not simply elevated them, but they carried uh, their culture with them, as we'll discuss a little bit later uh, in this series. Sweet notes that despite the fact that they were denigrated by Portuguese society, the people who were enslaved who were priests may not necessarily have carried on their culture with them, but they did carry on the synchronistic religion and synchronistic cultural practices with them. In other words, this group of warrior priests called the Jin Banda from the western part of Angola, uh, who is pictured here um, from a 14th century uh, Portuguese painting, um, continue to exist today. Sweet suggests that the Jin Bandas were uh, a transvested, quote, caste of spiritual leaders who, during the slave trade, carried on their culture despite their oppression eventually by colonizers. But more importantly, they represented a, quote, distinct third sex that the Portuguese could not categorically recognize. This created an epistemological boundary, which they uh, tried to overcome with religion. Long story short, sweet notes, their power diminished eventually with the colonization of Africa and with the reframing of the word. In fact, he traces the history of the word. He says that in Angolan societies, the term Jin, uh, jin Banda eventually, or Jin Bandas, eventually comes to mean sodomite. So whereas once they were called healers, they eventually were called simply receptive, passive people in the act of sodomy, likely by uh, after colonization by the Portuguese. Sweet notes that with the act of seasoning, the act of cutting one's hair, the act of preventing uh, indigenous Africans from speaking their language, the act of stripping them of their name, the act of erasing their individuality, created someone as a gender neutral tabula rasa upon which an assignment of culture could be established. 
However, you can never control the mind. You're always free as long as your spirit knows it. Sweet concluded that the Jin Bandanas um, may not necessarily have had the power to carry over their, their culture through, uh, through the African Middle Passage. But something about their culture survived into the present day because queer people are represented in the synchronistic religions such as voodoo, as we'll discuss a little bit later uh, today. Whatever the case, there's a continuity of category. Queer people were represented one way in Africa, part of the way through the Middle Passage, of which we may or may not have records, but that categorical representation survives, which means that the name survives, which means that someone somewhere called themselves the same thing. If we don't have a history of the individuals beyond a few court records, we have the name of the category. We have the people and we have the culture, which continues on. For more information, folks can consult uh, Recreating Africa, Culture, Kinship, and Religion in the African Portuguese World, 1440 to 1770 uh, by James Sweet. And that is all I have. That's great. Oh, wow. That's a, that, that brings up a lot of, of thoughts for me, right? So the first thing that I think about, like that time frame that where the Portuguese start start colonizing, right? The the that Western portion of Africa, right? Uh, during that time in Europe, right? What do we have going on there? We have the Inquisition sweeping through uh, Europe, targeting particularly people who violated. Um, uh, gendered norms when it come when it came to labor. So they they were shifting things like targeting midwives, right? Uh, they were targeting uh, women healers, right? They they were definitely targeting folks who were uh, sexually or gender diverse from kind of the normative. Uh, foundations of masculinity, femininity, and men's roles and women's roles and public public roles and private roles, they're really starting to regulate that heavily during that 15th, 16th, 17th century in Europe through through violence, right? Through kidnapping, similar, similar tactics I'm hearing, through kidnappings, uh, through torture, through forced confessions, in gruesome public executions, like burnings and strangulations and things like that. So it, this, this colonization process going on in Europe, being exported out into Africa, being exported out into, into the recently discovered lands of the, the new world, right? Like the, the recently, dis, you know, European discovered lands, I should say. Uh, of, of the Americas and really that attempt to wipe out, uh, you know, gender diversity, queerness, it was really clearly systemic, right? And at the same time, right, you have, uh, you have England uh, moving towards connections with India and anybody that studied uh, the history of India and the British Raj and the colonialism of that would be familiar with the, the laws enforced on India from British rule around sexual behavior, around gendered behavior, uh, and their attempted eradication of third gender identities there as well. So, you know, again, we're, we're seeing how colonialism, both internal colonialism has happened in Europe and and external colonialism that they exported to the rest of the world impacts uh, gender diverse and sexually diverse people. Uh. One thing we have to consider here, especially for this case in Africa, is that this is the close of the medieval period in Europe and the beginning of the early modern period. Mm -hmm. um, so it's characterized by things like the Hundred Years' War in Europe, the wars of succession, um, the wars of religion, the wars of religion in Africa, the uh, massive trade, the establishment of large empires, um, and 
many Afri people of African American descent, pe black people who live in the United States, whose ancestors were enslaved uh, by Europeans, um, can trace their lineage to those specific kingdoms, Dahomey, Benin, uh, so on and so forth. They can trace a queer identity through those same categories as well. While you get some laws in colonized spaces and much more so characteristically in the 19th century, particularly in the British and French empires, queer people were actually protected by the states of Africa uh, up until they were colonized or killed or conquered by the French and British in the 19th century. We should establish that the kingdom of Ghana had an openly gay king in the 19th century. We should establish that there were, as we did in the last video, that there were multiple representations of queer people at all levels of government in many of these kingdoms. Yes, some of them did sex work, some of them were, but some of them were advisors to royalty. Some of them were chieftains. Some of them were accepted here and there. So that suggests that there's something different about objectification of queer people under European colonialism. And that's very much tied to racism and classism. In other words, it's another hierarchical uh, order tied to the commodification of people. Meaning if your body does not make money for the people that own the means of production, that your body is worthless, right? Or your body is of lower value. It's the assignment, it's that old feudalistic system that goes back to patriarchal cultures like Rome. Whatever the case here is that something is different about European slavery. You could buy yourself out of slavery in, in almost every other culture, and many people did for generations. Sometimes you fell in, sometimes you got out. But with European slavery, it was so much more about objectification and power and dominance to prevent the property of people, that's in a class of people, from rising up. Remember that Europeans only made anywhere from 1% to 10% of the colonial uh, population, right? The vast majority of the other people were indigenous or slaves. And out of that Caribbean Atlantic culture, the power which controls, which is so much more insecure, is the power which prescribes more um, dangerous, uh, more uh, punitive laws. And that's true of, of, of many cultures I've studied from pre-Civil War South Carolina to, uh, to the 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 to the British occupied Jamaican islands or other places. Wherever people who in power fear for their lives, they're gonna have more and more means of objectification and more and more means of domination over people that they rule, which is interesting for this case. Anyway, but the idea here is that queer people had protections in Africa and they survived through the Middle Passage of which we haven't done a good job yet of talking about the injustices and the and the dehumanization that went on for generations. Yeah. And another thing that, that came up listening to this piece was your your reference to to how many folks were were uh, were sent to serve in the Navy, right? And um, I think even historically though, right, there's a there's oftentimes a a queer aspect to uh, at least independent, you know, naval, right? Like the for many for many folks, and and I'm sure we're going to get to this at some point, or I hope we do, right? The 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 Caribbean uh, buccaneer cultures, right, were heavily influenced by uh, queer, sort of queer traditions or incorporated queerness within those traditions. So uh, it's, it's interesting to reflect on that in terms of how did it really, did, you know, did these, were these folks, did these folks wind up getting subsumed into these other aspects of sort of nautical queer culture? in a way at some point. So there are a total of six 
talks in this, and we'll get actually into that a little bit more next time, talking about the dehumanization um, in the Middle Passage and talking about how queer women form social bonds called Matiism to protect themselves. Um, and then we will talk the time after that about uh, Equiano, um, Odula Equiano, who was, a, who was an anti-slavery activist in late 18th century Britain uh, and was a descendant of and came from West Africa and the colonial project. But yes, there is a, in almost all cases where you have a frontier culture where there are large numbers of, one, uh, of gender imbalance, you're going to have larger representations of queer people because that's how humans form communities around sex and around community. And that's very evident in the Mati culture that uh, we'll look in Suriname, uh, Guyana in South America and in um, the United States and in uh, Car the Caribbean na next time. And then when we look at the, the construction of the Caribbean as a colonial project, we'll look at the ratios uh, and, and the studies of uh, the few cases of sodomy that we found in, in Jamaica um, at, uh, over the course of three centuries. So yes, there is a large homosocial part to this. There's a large queerness represented in the African diaspora, so much so that I think people will be very surprised. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, any last any last thoughts on this topic? And just that when folks are looking for more stuff about this in African history, you're looking for spaces that are highly representative of homosocial culture where there's a gender imbalance, a lot more men or women than one culture. And where you at, wherever you see places of gender illusion, you almost always see representations of queer people in human history. But for next time, we're gonna talk about uh, Matiism and women loving women, and then uh, conclude with the uh, 18th and 19th centuries in that series. Great, looking forward to it. We'll have the bibliography down in the description as well as uh, any uh, links that David might have for where we can do follow-ups. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, hit the notification icon. And um, what do you all think? What, uh, what are some stories or what are some pieces from history that really uh, speak to you as, uh, as a queer person, as a gender diverse person, where, where do you find your connections from? Make some comments down in the down, in the down below um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, David. Thank you. I should clarify, I said Jonathan Sweet, it's James Sweet, I apologize. Thanks guys, <laughs> have a good night. All right, thank you.